From reviews to rankings, the big picture is all things movies. From in-depth analysis of the latest flick to sit-down interviews with some of the biggest movie stars and filmmakers on the planet, Sean Fennessy and Amanda Dobbins have got you covered. Check out the big picture on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. This episode is brought to you by Anytime Fitness. We may talk a whole lot about sports, but when it comes to keeping fit ourselves, there's definitely room for improvement. I hit this point early July. I was just like, I am not in good enough shape. I started trying to walk at least 15,000 steps a day or hiking or just anything to keep my legs moving. Now it's the end of 2023. I feel great. I had a physical uh, three weeks ago and the guy was like, you're doing great. You're doing better than you were three years ago. I felt great. Whatever your goals are, progress is possible. Thanks to Anytime Fitness. Get a personalized plan and support from an expert coach anytime, anywhere. Visit anytimefitness.com to try Anytime Fitness for free. Start to train for your life. Terms, conditions, and restrictions apply. See website for details. This episode is brought to you by State Farm. From your morning podcast to your afternoon playlist, State Farm knows you personalize your entire day. And that's why State Farm helps you personalize your insurance with the State Farm Personal Price Plan. It offers coverage options that help protect what you care about most at an affordable price just for you. Like a good neighbor, State Farm is there. Prices vary by state. Options selected by customer. Availability and eligibility may vary. I need sports to have to clear the room. Stand up and walk now. Hello and welcome to The Watch. My name is Chris Ryan. I am an editor at TheRinger.com and joining me on the other line He knew that copy of In Utero would come in handy. It's Andy Greenwald! Great sync. Great sync. A lot (laughs) of uh, viral marketing for Dave Grohl's auto bio. You love to see it. So do you think that in Shiv... uh, Welcome to The Watch. We're talking about Succession episode three today, and it's all happening. And I was wondering, Andy, you know, the pivotal scene in this episode where Shiv's town hall gets ruined by Kendall's uh, gorilla playing of rape me from in in utero by Nirvana. Dude, do you think she Ken was like grabbed the he grabbed the ox cord, bro? Do you he think grabbed the ox was, cord? She was more mad that it wasn't like because personally, I would have gone for like Scentless Apprentice or Francis Farmer will have a revenge. On I, I don't mean anything judgmental in this, but Shiv is a Penny Royalty fan. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, Shiv likes Penny Royalty. She probably likes the All Apologies on Unplugged. I don't know how hard she gets with the catalog. You know. How- how old Wait, I don't is judge Ken- her. How old is Kendall? Chris, you're starting with this. How old are any of these people? Well, I Ellen Ruck is Ken- 65 years young. When when was Kendall really like vibing out to in utero? Was he like, they got Albini to engineer this? It's really, really <laughs> happening. I, I can't decide which to do first because I would love to talk to you about their <laughs> CD wallets circa 1998 because I feel yeah. like that's a rich text for us. I also feel like your question brings up an important point, which is the show very intentionally smudges the ages of these children because the whole point is, is that they're children and that mm-hmm. they're totally arrested. And so one could, as I did this week, just just Google Kieran Culkin and be like, he's 39. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But it, it doesn't matter. And that's part of the allure. Um, to your question, I think that Ken is probably, he's probably has hit four zero, three nine four zero. He's in that range. So, yeah, so I think he probably had one of the family's more trusted servants go to Sam Goody and buy him. Yeah. Yeah. Like, and and buy him a copy of the Nirvana record. But I don't think he, like, took it to the next level. I don't think he listened to the Fastbacks or the Vaselines. You know what I mean? Yeah. I I mean, he, he, he was pretty much long box in the front top 10 kind of shopper. Ken definitely seems to be going through a slime season of his own right now. I think he's moved on from grunge in general, especially in the limo. He's listening yeah. to rap. Let's get into it. We'll start with the way we usually do with just some broad thoughts about the episode. Uh, good tweet, bad tweet. Oh, I love it. Okay. Um, I, I can't I, I can't break it down into just you a simple thing. It's hard to be, thought. I have well, big give, tweet. give me the whole thing. Yeah, give me the big tweet. Well, <laughs> okay, but I want to put a parenthetical around the fact that I do love that the show is coming for the internet's throat. (laughs) Terrible. I love that it's coming for the internet's throat in general, you know, Uh from the Z-Way show to just the the way Twitter is, is just, you know, red pilling, poison pilling Kendall's brain. Um, 
Yeah. That's not what red pilling means, but I'm going to try to tweet through it. <laughs> you're, um, you're taking back red pill? <laughs> yeah, is that, that's okay. I'm going to reclaim it as a Matrix fan. So here's what I wanted to say about this episode in general. And I think that it speaks to the episode's um, strengths and a little bit of its challenges. I think that the show is at its best when it highlights how utterly bubbled off and siloed the ultra rich are from the Mm -hmm. world that they purport to run. And I think, you know, Jesse Armstrong's quote at some point in the last few months when asked about the upcoming or then in production season three about the decision not to depict the pandemic has really rung in my ears as we've been watching the season. You know, the comment was, we decided not to do it. And obviously there were probably many reasons, including the fact that they wrote this season and were about to film it when, you know, there started to be like ill tidings out of Wuhan. But I think that his answer, which was, it didn't change how rich people behave anyway. So why would it affect our show? Kind of speaks to one of the essential, one of the, one of the essential uh, themes of the show, which is the total silo of their lives. Yeah. And, you know, by the way, side tweet, Am I doing this right? <laughs> Thread. If I if I was still a TV critic, I feel like there is an essay to be written about how all the great shows of this century have in one way or another been about a group of people, a culture, a subculture, a lifestyle that is essentially siloed away or yes. that has been, you know, we don't, I mean, you know, this is not news and this is not news for the pandemic that we as a American people don't really talk to each other anymore or cross paths anymore. Everybody's in their own lane. And I think all of the shows, whether it's, you know, the, the Sopranos 20 years ago, or whether it's, we were just talking about this, the vampires of Staten Island and what we do in the shadows, like all, none of these people touch other worlds. It's just like sure. a window inside of a world. That said, I think that succession is at its best when the characters who are completely confident in their societal Iron Man suits, Stark Industries, are forced to interact with other people's bubbles, particularly if the bubbles are of a different cast or a different social level. I was thinking about the majesty of that season two, I think, season two episode, Turnhaven, when the Roys meet the Pierces, and they are both super rich, but they couldn't be more different. And all Mm -hmm. of the comedy of... It's a a comedy of social errors and mores and values just on display. And the challenge of the plot that Jesse Armstrong chose for the beginning of this season is that it is a circular firing squad. And it's about the people within the bubble going after the other people in the bubble. And so it's starting to feel a little claustrophobic. And we're starting to lose some of that um, cross-current energy. Um, this was the episode where it started to bleed out a little bit because we saw, you know, the the media worlds and the government worlds, which I think are going to be more the focus of the season. We started to see what happens when Kendall, whose brain makes perfect sense when he's in his multi-million dollar penthouse, actually takes the elevator down and enters these other worlds and it doesn't go great. Yeah, I when I was in watching this show, like during the episode, I think some of my... Uh, my cringe reflex was kicking in where I was like, this is just so uncomfortable to watch Kendall try to um, garner the approval of like a a group of people or a majority of people out there who probably would just as soon piss on him if he was on fire and his desire for them to like basically let him into the club. You know, he has been ostracized from his family. He's been ostracized Mm -hmm. from the way of life that he knew, even the, you know, in the second season when he's, a shell of a human. He's still protected by Logan. And now he's out there. He's got Naomi. He's kind of got Greg, who's essentially like almost openly a double agent. He's got (laughs) Reese, the watch dealer who's popped up. Love that guy. (laughs) And then he's out there trying to get Z way to think that he's, that he's cool or that he's like a a, a disruptor to, to name check the name of the episode. Yeah. Or in on the joke, you know, um, that there's something I thought that the episode was at its sharpest when and I was going to say when it depicted something it actually wasn't even depicting it. Um, Armstrong and his writers, you know, they they laid down the benchmarks and the fences, but the episode lived or died. And I think it lived on Jeremy Strong's performance because yeah. 
he is able to channel that sick, sinking feeling that far too many of us understand and recognize when you've done a tweet. You know, you wouldn't like you've you've done a tweet and you're feeling good about it. And then yeah. it starts to pick up and some people are responding to it. And you're like, this is what I wanted. And then it's like eating too much candy corn at Halloween. It's like, no, no, no. Not only did you not want this, the part of your body that isn't controlled by your animal brain definitely didn't want this. And it's about to get worse. And I don't know. But but to try to can you help me figure out why I was like, yeah this is corny while it was happening. But then when the episode was over, I was like, that made sense. I guess maybe it's because of where it ends up with him having a fucking panic attack in a backstage part of the Sophia Wobie show, you know? Well, I, I guess I, I guess I have two. I guess I have two responses. One is, you know, anytime there's an element always when, uh, an audience sees something that it is slightly familiar with being depicted or satirized. Maybe that's it. The kind Maybe of knee jerks. And, and, and I always point to, we always point to, because we worked, I mean, we were not like David Simon S. newspaper reporters, but I always point to the fifth season of The Wire and its depiction of journalism. And it, you know, it doesn't feel, it well, feels almost like- for me personally, it was like the first season because as a, a longtime murder yes. police, it was just difficult yes. to see the mistakes. Oh, if we're going to be yeah. honest, I spent a lot of years on the docks, you know, the, the calluses on these hands speak to it. So for me, Why season two Why do you think we have the supply chain the issues that we do? You pivoted to show running <laughs> and now you've got fucking stacks. How dare of- you? The guy I came up with there, Doug, ran- <laughs> That shipyard, you know, with an iron fist. Um, so I, anyway, all this is to say, um, poking fun at extremely online culture is a very, str- it's a very strange target in that it is rich, but it is also uncomfortably just already kind of a self parody. Yeah, so it feels kind of odd to train your worship guns on it, which the show appears to be doing. I think that Ultimately, the show, this episode, packed a very succession esque, very you know, hall, top class television esque wallop, because it, it not just in performance and in execution and the and the, the ending montage with the raid and Kendall's breakdown. I mean, it was beautifully staged and Nicholas Bertel's music was wonderfully chosen as it always is. But I thought it really highlighted what the show never strays too far from, which mm-hmm. is this weird disconnect the Roys have, and I think we as a society have, between uh, language and feeling, right? Because for the Roys, words are just weapons. They just hurl them with absolute insane impunity at each other. I mean, it's been a, I was going to say it was this episode, but it's every episode. The things that Logan says to Roman in particular are just, I mean, you can can see every therapist in the tri-state area's eyes lighting up like the money emoji. I mean, it's yeah. just, it's it's just hit after hit of savagery. Then that writ large is kind of where we're at with how we talk to each other online, the way the, the show, the TV show within the show, they were all like, Hey man, it's just, it's just jokes. Like we just got to do our thing and you're going to do your thing. And we all understand it's not personal, but everything, everything's personal, you know, everything's personal. And so Kendall can say, hateful things to Shiv's face because that's their that's their love language. But when she writes his innermost demons in an open letter to the press, I mean, that is beyond the pale. That's, yeah, that's I actually mean, triggering something. I think one of the things that has been an adjustment watching this season has been there have been a couple of events that the filmmaking does not necessarily... Uh, set up as this is pivotal, you know, like, and it not, that's not a criticism. It's like when you're watching Mad Men and Don Draper walks into a pitch meeting, I mm-hmm. think that Mad Men for a variety of ways trained you to expect something important to happen in a pitch meeting. That's where Don is going to give this monologue about, you know, um, the American experience. And it's going to be this kind of huge moment for the show. But the way that Succession is kind of shot with this verite style and everything is sort of happening out of the corner of your eye and conversations just sort of emerge in the foreground or the background and then all of a sudden are, are, are happening. I don't necessarily always pick up on, is this just another scene where Logan is reaming someone out or is this a pivotal plot moment? So the case in point here that I, I think I'm most talking about is the interaction between Logan and Michelle from the White House after she appears on the TV a, a news broadcast and they kind of have this side meeting and Logan is just like, basically like get your guy involved, help me out in this situation. And she's just like 
okay, but not really. And he's like, yeah, but not really. Like there's that dance that they do, yeah. which obviously winds up triggering to some extent the FBI raid at the end of the episode. In the same sense, Kendall and Shiv have had countless amounts of jousting over the last season or two. Sometimes it's very emotional. Sometimes it's very barbed. I guess it was almost a surprise to see Shiv be like, he ruined my town hall. He's fucking dead, dead now. You know what I mean? Yes, and I think that what you're highlighting speaks to one of the major challenges of this season, which is it is a little bit unsettling and confusing locating where the stakes are at any given moment. Because we're presented with characters who are masters of the universe. They obviously have no financial worries. It is almost entirely interior and emotional. And yet, and yet, you know, we are, this season is really about an existential crisis in both the company and the family, which are often stand-ins for each other. But it's not always clear where we stand or where each of those particular chess pieces stand. For example, heading into the season finale last year, it felt like Waystar, Waystar Royco was on absolutely thin ice due to the shareholder uh, you know, the hostile takeover and Sandy yeah. and Stewie, et cetera, et cetera. And that was the, you know, meteor to the dinosaur event that was going to an extinction level event that was going to black out the sun unless they fixed it. Since then, and by the way, nothing has changed with that circumstance. We just haven't talked about it that much. Obviously, we did see briefly Stewie and Sandy over Zoom or whatever that was going to be in the premiere. So it's not gone. And the show is servicing that. But since then, the other crises have overtaken that in terms of importance, Kendall's betrayal uh, and, and and subsequent media campaign, and now the federal government raiding the company over its criminality and exposure because of what happened in the cruise lines. It can be head spinning. That's mm-hmm. a lot of crises at once. And it's not really clear which one is paramount, which one is most devastating. And, you know, again, and I say this, I don't really care when they talk about stock terms and stuff because I don't understand it. And it's just, you know, like when um, George Clooney and Anthony Edwards would talk about hematomas or whatever yeah, in right. ER. Like, I get it. I'm 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 worried about this person too. I <laughs> details I'm good with where my level of detail. But for example, with Kendall, not entirely sure what he's doing because I thought the point was he wanted to still take over the company, but right. now he seems to just be having a very public um, identity crisis and tantrum, which is interesting and worthwhile. But it's a little unclear what he is attempting to do vis-a-vis this extremely damaged company. So yeah. all of that has left me a little bit, it, it, I, I guess I'm trying to articulate how uh, I feel a number of things at once here. And I think I share some of your reactions. One is, I love this show. I love these three episodes. I've been having a great time watching them and talking about them with you. Um, I also feel a little bit at sea. I'm not entirely sure where we are after these three episodes that have at times felt like treading water. And then every so often, there's just, you know, a a, a massive wave. And the end of this episode felt like another wave that might push us to another place. Yeah, like I still still think that this show's bread and butter is keeping all of these people in a room together, cutting each other to pieces. And so any one interaction, like this episode featured several, I I guess I could actually run through what happens in this episode because I think that might be useful just to give us like a sense of what's going on. So it obviously, it starts with Kendall giving an interview to a, I I assume the Times. I I would say it's really quite a renaissance at the moment for people pretending to be Maggie Haberman on TV shows as that is also, you know, been a big part of the morning show and and everything. Was she Maggie Haberman or was she, was this more of a profile? Was this more of like a Rebecca Traister, Vanessa Gregoriadis, New York Magazine? Because it looked like they were an ABC V. That was my vibe, but please go on. I I don't mean to reduce everybody down to the Habes, but you you know what I'm saying. And then uh, the family reacts by you know, agreeing that someone, one of the kids is going to have to go out in front of the press and talk about what a great father Logan is. Tom and Greg, uh, I, I think stock. I was resisting Chris. Sorry to interrupt you just because no, by all means. I never, the leftovers was a great HBO TV show, but I, I've never actually experienced the, you know, what, what was it called on the show when, when everyone just vanished the, the great, whatever, like I've never actually experienced that in real life. Uh, the way that I did the day after the election, I, you know what I was Maggie Haberman, you know what I was going to say just when you were asking me that is I was yeah. going to say, you mean the snap <laughs> that I forgot that that was the, yeah, well, okay, sure. The snap, the, the, that, that's the mainstream version of the show, the leftovers. But anyway, that's what Maggie Haberman, that, that happened to her in my life the day after the 2020 presidential election. 
Wait, like, like half the people in your life disappeared? Okay. No, so, I, I, I snapped my finger and I stopped following her and then I never thought about it again. Um, no disrespect. Okay, so Logan, Tom and Greg take stock of their liability in uh, Greg's new office. At a journalism soiree, Shiv sees an old flame. Nate, shout out to my, my guy from a teacher coming back. No, my guy from Dan Brown's The Lost Fucking Symbol, man. That's <laughs> Professor Robert Langdon on the Peacock Network. Lord of the Cucks on a teacher. I love Incredible. that guy. Um, and uh, Shiv meets with Kendall. They have, I think, a pretty significant interaction. Like, Kendall's yeah. This Is You Now, and he keeps... This is a repeated like kind of linguistic motif over the course of the season. Is Kendall telling Shiv who or what she is at any given moment, which I do not think she cares for at all. But that was a very powerful moment, and and I think uh, a human moment, and yeah, in many there's... ways one that I, th- I think that him saying that it's you now, that you are now the one who is going to eat shit from our father in a public way. You know, obviously, there's a little bit of, in retrospect, a little bit of threat hanging over that because of what happens when she becomes the public face and what Kendall does to her for it. But I do think that there is a, as much as Kendall's capable of it, some honesty and empathy there. And I think that in some ways that triggers Siobhan's um, carpet bombing Mm -hmm. almost as much as the Nirvana needle drop did. For sure. And uh, I, I thought just it's worth noting that there was in some of the looks and Sarah Snook and Jeremy Strong are so good in that scene and they're just they've been so good this season in general. Some of that safe room level of sort of sensitivity and, and connection and vulnerability between the two of them, but it goes away quickly. Shiv goes back to Logan, who comes clean about being dirty to some extent. You know, I thought that that was really the way he put like. You know, mm-hmm. is there anything criminal on paper? No, or whatever, whatever, however he puts it. And then Greg has to buy the watch. Tom offers himself as sacrifice. Kendall gets triggered by a late night monologue and heads into the office. He tries to pressure, uh, Logan tries to pressure the White House. Kendall is visited by the ghost of Christmas past in the security guard who turns up uh, in the finale of season one. To and kind you confirm of, that. I know we were going to Yeah, I went out. back and watched. So that's the that's the security guard who basically is like, I've taken care of the situation for you. And that's when Logan brings broken ass Kendall into the to the room and is just like, I own you now. And then, yeah, so he's visited by that security guard. Great call back there. Kendall uh, ruins Shiv's town hall. Shiv tries to ruin Kendall, but the brothers won't sign on. Kendall sees Shiv's uh, statement and has a panic attack at the talk show, but is buoyed by the fact that the FBI raids Waystar Royco. Um, So that's basically what happened. You brought up Kendall's kind of state of being before I Mm -hmm. went into the plot synopsis. One of the interesting underlying things, and and I think that there are a lot of triggers for Kendall in this episode, not the least of which being a security guard who essentially knows that he's culpable for a felony being like, I see you, uh, (laughs) is his sobriety, which I I had a question about this as well. Always found like a really fascinating element of Kendall's character and that the way that they've kind of depicted it has been very uh, nuanced. He's, I what do we call it? Manhattan sober when you're just doing champagne and whatever the hell else he's doing with Naomi. I, I think that like the Naomi presence is, is really interesting. His dad never liked it. Um, he, despite the fact that Kendall was like swearing that they were good for each other in that regard, but he's, I think he's pretty lit for most of this episode and you could argue that a lot of his mood swings could be drug related, although not explicitly attached to that. What do you, what do you think of what's going on with him? I, I think that what the show is trying to do is, 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 you know, this is what Siobhan's letter hints at. And I think it, it's mentioned at another point in the episode. He's demonstrating addictive behavior. Mm-hmm. I think that he is literally in this case, high on his own supply. I, I do not think he is um, on cocaine. I think that the show has never really been cute about that like when he's using he's using Mm -hmm. it just seems like he is absolutely on an ego bender and you know the decision making like waking up and deciding to go into the office to get another hit is what is serving him in that moment you know i am curious about the naomi piece of it because unquestionably they're good for each other in that she seems very nice to him and they seem to have a good time together (laughs) she she brings over takeout yeah Uh, but She hasn't, I I think, I wonder if it's intentional that she hasn't had, she's had screen time, but hasn't had much to say. And I wonder if the the show is in in using that to sort of point to the fact that she is essentially still his drug buddy in that Mm -hmm. she is enabling this behavior. 
uh, if not specifically drugs at this moment. And the Kendall that we're left with at the end of the episode is, it's not the most dangerous Kendall for the stock futures of Waystar Royco, but it does appear to be one of the most dangerous Kendalls for Kendall. Yeah, Because I if mean, he doesn't have the action or the juice, um, <laughs> what does he have? Right. He gives, I'll have to go back and watch the sort of frame by frame of it, but I thought that his reaction to looking at his phone as it comes out that the FBI is raiding Waystar was similar yeah. to Logan's reaction to seeing Kendall do the press conference, which was this mixture of, yes. it, it, it was it was kind of Sphinx-like where you're like, is he smirking? Is he happy? Is he freaking out because this is all real now? Like what's happening here? And he asked for it. I mean, mm -hmm. it didn't happen because of his high-powered attorney, but when he was absolutely flying you know, and he's like, I'm, you're the boss, you're the boss. But by the way, could we do this? And by the way, are the laws really the laws? He does say like, could we get a, some sort of public raid? And he gets it. So be careful what you wish for, I guess. This episode is brought to you by Mint Mobile. New Year's resolutions are fun the first couple of weeks. Then you kind of maybe conveniently forget about them halfway through January. No shame. It happens to us all. But this year I have a foolproof plan, at least when it comes to saving money. Just switch to Mint Mobile and you're done. Goal accomplished because for a limited time, their wireless plans are 15 bucks a month when you buy a three month plan. The great thing about Mint Mobile is there's no jaw dropping monthly bills or unexpected overages, and all plans come with unlimited talk and text. Get this new customer offer today at mintmobile.com slash watch. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Why does this room look amazing? What'd you change? I just got these custom shades from Blinds.com. It's all online, so it's really easy. I remember shopping for blinds. I waited around all day just to get a quote. It took forever. And the worst part? Hidden fees. How about you? I chatted with my Blinds.com design consultant on my time. Plus, they make it easy to DIY or add installation like I did. Blinds.com sounds way better. Way better. Shop Blinds.com for up to 45% off. Rules and restrictions may apply. What did you think of Kendall being like, uh, Greg, I'm not buying your fucking watch, man? <laughs> I like, mean, that's I, like I a think... perfect indication of who Kendall is. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I mean, well, look, one of the things the show has always excelled at is the way, depicting the myriad ways in which bullshit flows down the mountain because yeah. everyone can be um, both, you know, master and commander and cuck, like, on the show. Like, there's yeah. just constantly and and my you know the the best example of that is when tom is logan facing and he's just eating shit like it's an ortolan bird at you know a fancy manhattan restaurant yeah. and then immediately turns and just absolutely marquis de sade abuses craig like when he puts mints on his table and says they're cyanide pills um so seeing kendall do that so easily and so well is funny. And it's also a reminder of just how he actually works and thinks in the world. You know, if, if he was ever actually challenged by anyone or asked to explain what he means when he shouts about the patriarchy. It also is one of the show's recurring motifs, which is that at a certain point, they probably should stop mistreating the gangly cousin who knows everything. <laughs> like I, that you should probably buy him the watch, you know, like that sure. seems fine. That seems like maybe something that would be helpful in that moment. I mean, even Tom is like, I will buy you a watch if you come over and talk to me. Um, what, what did you think of our, our Tom Siobhan check-in? We haven't really had a lot of uh, uh, so, FaceTime with America's yeah, favorite couple. This was, uh, I think the first time that they've been together since the aborted for threesome, you know, it's like they, uh, they've essentially been apart since the boat, right? Well, they had, I mean, since they, not just they brought a threesome, but that sad, like... The um, cove, where it's like, I, the it's, 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 I'm more sad being with you than I would be without you. I thought it was interesting. If I, I, if I, I thought if this episode had a theme, it was these characters rec like reckoning with the impossibility of not being Roy's, you know? And that right. goes all the way down to the people who are really only peripherally on the, in the Roy family, like Tom uh, or Greg. And contemplating what life would be like outside of it. And I think that's part of what is fueling Kendall needing a whole posse to go with him everywhere and laugh at Twitter yeah. that tweets about him and egg him on and obviously also milk money from him somehow. But it's also there when Tom is like, would it be good if I voluntarily took on prison time for the sake of your family, essentially, and 
you know, I know that, you know, there's obviously the implication that he would be taken care of, but, you know, and Logan's like, what's your angle? The angle is because he's, he wants to be a Roy and he thinks that's the price. Money actually doesn't matter in this world. I mean, Connor suddenly being like, I need a hundred mil. That was, that was interesting, but Generally, that that's I mean, what like, we're looking. I need some sucky sucky. Is that what you're talking? <laughs> well, he, I, I meant last season when he yeah. asked his dad for. Yeah, but I think he needs a lot of things apparently. But yeah, like it, they're just so so lonely. You know, you just want to be in. They need to be in the room, or else what do they have? And then they have another room, I guess. It's extremely well appointed, and and the show never never stints on that. I mean, uh, the 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 Tom Siobhan, you know, like it completely like sanitized modernist hyperbaric yeah. pod with like even like the water bottle she pulled out of the refrigerator was is just like sculpted ceramics everything yeah. was perfect yeah um but did she like she what, baked a ziti for her robin and connor or something that's what they need like that yeah. that they need yes when she was cooking and everything in her house like they they need to be in the room otherwise what are they and what do they have um and it's sad i mean that the, the <laughs> the the moment when Kendall puts on the TV and we see the Sophie show for the first time and the, all these people in the room and it's like, wait, who are they? And the pa- what are the power dynamics of the room? Because at a certain point, he's like, it's okay to laugh. This is funny. I'm loving this. I'm loving it. And everyone's like, this feels gross. This feels very weird at this moment. And I'm not sure what to make of it. Yeah, I mean, as far as Tom and Shiv go, I don't know. I was kind of wondering whether you saw any kind of, like, what did you think of the, clearly bringing the Nate character back is supposed to, I mean, aside from mm-hmm. Succession's real ability to never truly like flush a character out like it's not like you're just doing three episodes and then you're gone like it wouldn't surprise me if holly hunter popped back up or mm-hmm. cherry jones pop back up one day but shiv's like sort of road not taken do you think that's what that was about by seeing nate and then also see having tom kind of be broken in her arms there i think everybody on the show is so brilliantly um illustrated in terms of what motivates them, who they are, uh, what they want. And what motivates, or what's not motivates, what sustains Siobhan, I think, is this construction that there's always another option for her, right? I think that's what allows her to feel in control of a situation and not feel like the prisoner of the situation. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're starting to see as we hit into the third season is she is choosing a lot of her door number twos. Mm -hmm. I think that the version of her that we never really got a full glimpse of was her career outside of the family business, which she did with, I guess, you know, joy and brio, but was able to do so because she knew at any moment she could could always go back. back. Yeah. And so then she got what she most wanted slash was most afraid of, which was she got brought in and she really, really wanted it. And then what are the choices after that? Like, she's not exactly going to go back to the nonprofit gala circuit after becoming the public face of um of nirvana's rape me you know what i mean like that's that door is no longer open to her similarly you know she could be engaged to the right person within the company but also have whatever other relationship she wanted and that door closed when she got married and when tom maybe wasn't as freaky as she wanted him to be (laughs) So now what? And mm-hmm. and the, the thing that's on Sarah Snook's face in this episode that I really appreciated was a kind of increasing sense of the, of the walls closing in on her. She's not going to prison. Her husband is eagerly volunteering to, but her options feel a lot less vibrant, I think, than they were um, a short time ago. When you read this show as a drama, which I think it is ultimately, even if it's got a lot of comedic elements, a lot of what the comedic elements do act as... Uh, sort of distancing tactics. It's like Siobhan, Shiv never really has to stick her neck out because she can always just be like, well, I'm not the president or my brothers did it or my dad did it or I also might go work for Bernie Sanders or whatever. And in a lot of ways, I thought that the whole town hall, the prep sequence and the the actual town hall was my favorite scene in the show, the episode, just because the whole idea of like, here are all the real questions. And it was just like, what the fuck is going on? And then they were like, well, we made a list of what people really probably wanted to ask. (laughs) And Shiv's, you know, gets up there and she's so well composed and she's so well put together. And her brother undermines it with, you know, a tactic probably, you know, best appreciated by rock critics of our age, but still like a really, you know, like an effective um, viral kind of stunt. And the spit into the journal was really powerful. Like I thought she mm-hmm. was like, she, she was conveying a lot of different emotion, embarrassment, hurt, pride, pure rage, humiliation, you know? 
everything in these people's lives is designed to minimize exposure to actual base emotions, whether mm-hmm. it is, you know, anger or, you know, I mean, we could, we could get it or, or love perhaps. Um, but there are moments and the show excels in those moments when the armor blips off, like we saw in fatal moments of Dune, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? <laughs> and they are exposed and they cannot be protected from it. And you think about, you know, Siobhan just being publicly humiliated. And there is no escape. And she looks around and she can yell at Fisher Stevens all she wants, but it happened. There's right. nothing that can be done undone about that. And, and, and it makes you think of um, Logan's attitude, you know, which throughout the episode up to the very end is fuck him. And when he's asked to explain why, you know, he's like, well, the, it's, it's like the law is just basically it's people and people are politics and I can handle politics. Yeah. Yes, that is a galaxy brain way of looking at it right up to the point that the FBI breaks in your front door. Like it is all... Well, am I really saying that? You're not really saying it. So we both agree not to say it. Yeah, it's all bullshit. Like, as we've learned in America over the last few years, sure. laws are basically bullshit until suddenly they're not. And probably better for them to be, uh, to to not be bullshit the majority of the time. But there is a breaking point for, for everyone. And that's what this season appears to be doing um, methodically to each member of the cast. Can I just mention, you know, when we first uh, when we first got started with this season, you had a theory or you pointed out that this show is so excellent at bringing on uh, New York theater actors and putting them like in plug and play roles into this. And uh, Lisa Edmond, who plays Michelle Ann from the White House, is just another example of that. People might recognize her from TV from like Good Fight or Good Wife or I mean, she's I, she's mm-hmm. played someone named Carolyn like four times on three different <laughs> Law and Order shows. But she is like a super, she's been in multiple Tony Kushner plays. She did Death of a Salesman with Philip Seymour Hoffman. Like this is that good shit that, that succession yeah, just like it, when they need somebody, it's there. I wish, I hope everyone is learning from this. And, um, you know, I just sent you before we recorded Vulture has a f- wonderful interview with the great theater actor, Stephen McKinley Henderson, who's having a, you know, he's in his seventies and he's having this amazing, not career renaissance, but suddenly like widescreen boost. With, by being in Dune and Devs and Lady Bird, et cetera. And people are figuring out what a titanic actor he is. Well, if you've, if you've seen August Wilson plays and things or been involved in watching New York theater for the last 30 years, you know. Yeah. You know who the Titans are. And they're there. And I love that you pointed her out because, I mean, think about what the casting director saw in the scripts, which is basically like, we need a new character to come in cold. And like, it's basically like, who is the person on the bench who can come into the game midway through it and face the pitcher who's throwing a hundred mile per hour? Yeah, who's going to walk into a room? Congratulations, you're going into a glass office with Brian Cox. Not just Brian Cox, Brian Cox playing a character who is the fucking bull after the fourth matador has brought the swords out. You know what I mean? Like you, you are not walking into like benign Logan Roy on a boat. You're walking into the absolute firing squad and you got to parry back. And that being said, she did. I, I do feel like I, I'm sure I'll be proven wrong. So far, Sana Lathan's character seems the most uh, compromised by COVID because it's been, I feel like it's a lot of like talking to Lisa for 30 seconds or calling her on the phone. Yeah. Well, I do wonder, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, is it, we could play a game with this show and maybe other shows where we could play a, a game called Context or COVID. Like right. one of the worst things ever to happen to filmed entertainment was the cell phone because characters don't They just, don't have to go over, yeah. yeah. I mean, like like Seinfeld, they were just walking into each other's apartments all the time. You sure. know what I mean? Like that's the nature of filmed entertainment. Um, there is a case to be made that super rich people don't need to always sit down with their lawyers at Midtown. <laughs> But there's also a case to be made that when you're under strict filming protocols and your cast is divided into zones one through six, you get a lot more phone calls. Well, all of a that sudden. being said, that the the town hall was was chock full of people. Yeah, but are you doing the thing? Are you this level of savvy COVID watcher? So, like when the episode begins and there's a nice dolly shot through the restaurant, I am not looking at our eventual destination, which is where Kendall is sitting. I'm looking at every table and seeing how many people are sitting at them and if there are tables between the tables. <laughs> Like, I, I am absolutely wondering how they, and because whenever you're making a, a, a scene or shooting a scene with extras, you, there is an element of curation. Like, I want this couple here. Oh, this guy's interesting looking. Put him here. She can't 
keep her eyes off the camera, so we're going to bury her in the back or whatever. But I think in COVID, you really do have to paint it like a Bob Ross masterpiece. Sure. Where you have to very lovingly and carefully put certain people in certain places, and then you can't move them until you're done filming. Do you like a fennel salad for lunch, like Kendall? I was very curious about his fennel, because it seemed like where he is with his ego and how absolutely freaked out and control freaky he is being, that he obviously had downloaded the menu before arriving and chosen what would be the most like magazine feature detail. Yeah, he, he had dish. Dasha from Red Scare do it for him. Yeah. We got to circle back to that. I want to talk to you about her. Um, but then he actually ate the thing. So I'm not sure. I mean, Chris, like I, I, I have tried to be a salad guy in my life. I admire salad people. I feel like a big bowl of greens and stuff feels like the right thing to eat in the middle of the day. But I, I have to admit that I'm just not that person. It is not satisfying to me. And One thing I would say about salad life is that mm. um, it's pretty private for me. Like, I don't oh. really feel comfortable having other people watch me eat sweet green. I don't mm. think it's constructed for elegant eating. They shred it so that you can just put as much into your gaping maw as possible. Yes. I, well, it's a, that's it's the a thing. delivery so, service for nutrients and calories, and I'm trying to get out of there. I'm not trying to, like, I, chat with uh, Lynn Hirschberg while I have kale in my teeth. <laughs> No, that's why you eat truffle fries with Lynn Hirschberg, as that's MIA right. infamously did. I, um, you know, I, I've come around on Sweet Green. I have an order that I like now, but it doesn't make sense for me because because I'm so physically hungry when I'm eating lettuce. I eat, I overeat salad. Like yeah. I think I eat less if I get a sandwich and a bag of chips for lunch than if I get Sweet Green with chicken and almonds and spicy broccoli or whatever. And I'm just like, there must be more satisfying things hidden here if I just yeah. keep digging. You'll eat, like the amount of salad I eat in a sweet green salad, it way outweighs the amount of food I eat when I have like most of a sandwich. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I but really it's feel also, like there's something about the shoveling of it that is like, this is my private personal time for me and Timberwolves highlights and it, nobody <laughs> should be watching me. It's my shame. But but I feel like it's kind of an external reflection of one of the great sadnesses of life, which is this never ending Gatsby's green light hope that something better will be there, but maybe underneath the crisp rice puffs or whatever, like maybe there's something that's going to like, oh, did I get the heirloom tomatoes? Is that going to satisfy this, this no, hole inside of me? No, it's when you actually no. get like a, a, a repository of like green goddess somewhere in there and you're like, oh man, flavor down. <laughs> It's like getting, it's like fucking Renton in train spotting when you finally get to like an actually good part Something of it. Something with fat. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the, I want to ask you, so the Dasha from Red Scare thing. Yeah. First of all, that was real sticky for you. Like that was great for the brand when you mentioned that two weeks ago. People loved that. You okay. Know, you know how I'm always checking the men. I'm checking the menchies, checking what goes viral. The dirt bag left um, came out. Yeah. They did. They knew because you outed yourself. So I didn't know uh, what you were talking about. I did some light Googling, <laughs> but could could you explain? Because whoever she is, I'm yeah. really enjoying her on this show as yeah, she, kind of Kendall's uh, internet advisor slash Greg's watch consultant. I'm not going to um, embarrass myself by like trying to describe Red Scare other than the fact that it is just a podcast that is emerged out of, I would say, I don't even know what where like you would really like isolate them on the political spectrum, but it, it it's just like a politics and social culture podcast that has like come out over the last couple of years. But but is she an actor or is she a podcaster? She or is there a difference She's recently anymore? kind of emerged as a director and as an actor. Yeah. Uh, I think she's I think she's delightful on the show. Great. Dirtbag or no. I think she's really funny. And I think the energy is really good of Kendall's goon squad pouring out of the mystery machine. Well, it's, I think it's, it's really interesting fun. how that she has become kind of like part of the crew and I guess is yeah. Kendall's body man when it comes to trending topics, but is also sort of his facilitator and is like, yeah, yeah, like Greg should buy this watch and we should go to this party, but seems to have a much better idea of like, this is bad for you actually to get utterly dunked on by Z-Way. Like that's not a, like a good look. No, but I mean, I think that succession is many things. And one of the things that it is low-key incredibly good at is just being a devastating, not even parody, just devastating indictment of what passes for work in the 21st century. <laughs> like, honestly, none of these people are doing anything. You know what I mean? They're just talking about the people who talk about doing things. And in order to live that lifestyle, and look, we're, we're podcasting right now, so I am not pretending that we are not included in the blast area of this particular bit of uh, social satire. But um, 
I, I lost my train of thought because I realized I pointed the bullseye back at myself. But none this of these show, people. This show are, is satirical about like what work constitutes, and and yeah, you and, I are and, and a state a, a, like a, a symbol of that as well. Yeah, and so you know, to be a Twitter consultant for someone who is spiraling out and thus creating more tweets and thinking tweets are important, you kind of have to feed the beast while you're also giving the beast medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I thought the moment, obviously I thought this moment was important and significant, but the moment when Kendall like crashes the writer's room, yeah. you know, and they're all just sitting around and like the kind <laughs> was of- he like, I knew Dylan at the Lampoon. <laughs> I mean, it's all connected, first of all. And second, um, you know, in that very, very brief uh, glimpse of people wearing V-neck sweaters and drinking 5 p.m. coffees, which are all late night show writer's rooms, you also got that whiff of everyone makes their own- deals with the devil in terms of their level of complicity. And one thing, you know, that you could say if you're writing on a TV show that I'm not sure, I, you know, we won't get into necessarily after one episode what the Sophie show is contributing to the world in any particular way. But <laughs> right. but the writers are like, at least we're not that guy. Yeah, You know, they can always punch up and maybe they can afford rent in Manhattan or at least some of the older neighborhoods of Brooklyn. And that works for them. But <laughs> they also went to Harvard. And if they had chosen what they deemed to be a l- less morally acceptable path, they could live in Tribeca, but also potentially have legal exposure for what happened in cruises. You know what I mean? It, it's all a, a kind of sustained performance yeah, art fiction like of what one turn mean, of the of what wheel. Sus- We're all one turn of the wheel from one another. Uh, any other notes on this episode before we get out of here? I want to give. I feel like I, this is this is kind of like the the, the Roman Roman reigns supreme yeah. part of the podcast. Kieran Culkin's body language is really special. Yeah, the moment when he reads the letter, and then so much of what he does after that, and this he is like noteworthy for a character up. who's so verbal. Yeah. His body starts to to break, you know, and he he walks all the way backwards to the wall and almost and hinges at the waist, it's too painful for him. You know, he actually can't play in the arena, which I think is something that is, you know, that Logan already thinks and that maybe they all think, and maybe that speaks well of him ultimately. It, but, but weirdly, that, like, might also be good at his job. You know, it's it, that's the thing that's, it's he's such an interesting character. Another example of what you're talking about is when he goes to see Logan after the interviews come out mm-hmm. and Logan calls him what he calls him. And he does the rest of the scene with his chin and his clavicle, like basically like, you know, with his with his chin down and like, it's just like, it's his suit of armor to get through that conversation. Yeah. A, because Logan has essentially been like, why are you going into Jerry's office? But also is like, when the fuck did I take you fishing? And he's like, you didn't, Connor took me, you know, but I just thought it would make good copy. His, his way of like, kind of like, shelling up like turtle shelling up Mm -hmm. is so is so perfect and it communicates so much i don't believe in playing the game of watching the show being like who's redeemable like Mm -hmm. who's a good person i think the show succeeds because it it doesn't play that game but But you like the guy who blew up a satellite (laughs) of all of them who is the only one that consistently demonstrates some like twitching tendrils of baseline humanity weirdly it's roman Right. I, the only other thing I have written down here is uh, I, I love that, that Kendall's black baseball hat with no logo uh, is like his Batman uniform. <laughs> like when That's he's like he's... his Batman costume was he just like it gives him some sort of power of anonymity, but also like flair, but also like still take me seriously. Just his whole like getting into the office thing was really, really funny. Him sending the guy out to go get like a Sonos system. <laughs> And and yeah, the look on his face when he sees that security guard approaching, I don't think it's the last we have seen of that plot point, is what I will say. No, and I, I have not watched it, ahead, but it's we've now gotten a couple of breadcrumbs. It's been seeded. Yeah. yeah. So the, every, everything everything is absolutely intentional. Um, Any thoughts about I, where I, where we're going from here? I, I I think just to circle all the way back to what I said at the beginning, like I am eager for their non-COVID societal bubble to crash into another one. And it mm-hmm. feels like the government stuff is about to take a bigger a bigger turn. And I'm I'm very ready for that. I think the show clearly has a lot to say about the cozy relationship between uh, right-wing media and right-wing government. And mm-hmm. I'm maybe just because of where I'm sitting more interested that, in that than I am in the low-hanging Twitter parody, which sure. 
I am also here for. So I, I am eager to see what happens with that. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. It, it just feels this is a critical point in the season because I think that this next week might be the moment when we see if these three episodes were kind of circular firing squads because that is what that particular plot twist where Kendall betrays both the company and the family demands or if that is the engine of the season, whether for COVID or just character reasons that Jesse Armstrong wants to pursue. Because I yeah. do think that the aperture needs to get a little bit wider to, I, I agree uh, to succeed. Not to succeed. I mean, I, listen to me. The show succeeds. But I mean, in order, I, I would like to see it happen. It doesn't yeah, need this, to do this anything. This show, this episode had like a good relay race of like cause and effect and from scene to scene, which I think made it feel a little bit more like propulsive. You know, it was like mm -hmm. this happened and because of that, this happened and because of that, this happened. But we have now kind of done three episodes about, you know, what are we going to do about Kendall? And now that this FBI thing has come in, I, I'm, I, I anxiously await the arrival of Alexander Skarsgård and Adrian Brody and some of the other people that are supposed to be on this, this uh, season. So we'll wrap it up there. Thank you for listening to our uh, Succession pod today. Thank you to Kaya McMullen for producing. And, and uh, I think Kaya is not going to forget to watch the episode before we record again. I feel pretty <laughs> confident about that. <laughs> we'll be with you guys back on uh, Thursday. Thanks for listening to The Watch. <laughs>